Women Up Radio, designed to facilitate women's empowerment, improve your career, develop your talents, incorporate your passions, achieve fulfillment and success. Hello, this is Women Up Radio, supporting Empower Women. Today's talk is an interesting mixture about women, our changing role in society and business, our inner strength, our independence, and also about the benefits of being able to rejuvenate our source and inner energy. So it's part cultural, part career, and part wellness. I'm joined in the studio by my guest, Pamela Meeking-Stewart. She's an award-winning film and television producer and director for documentaries and drama. She's also a trained facilitator for HR and change management, career, professional, and life skills. And as well as all of that, she runs a wonderful retreat centre in New Zealand called The Woolshed Retreats. So, welcome to the programme, Pamela. Thank you, Anna. Hello. Hello. So, can I start? You're well known in New Zealand for your groundbreaking work in film and TV. And I know particularly for an award-winning documentary series that you did called Pioneer Women. Can you tell us more about the series? And also, what inspired you to make this documentary? Right. Well, it's um, a dramatised documentary series, which is when I made them, which is the first, the first series way back in 1983, I think, or 88. It was a very new way of making programmes. I mean, interesting, they say about television that it, Everything that we do in television is borrowed, you know, that the audio is borrowed from, from the way we learn about radio and, uh, you know, the pictures are because we learn from movies and so really it's just a sort of mishmash. But actually, Dramatised Documentaries was a new thing that actually hadn't been done in New Zealand before, though it certainly had been done overseas and I'd seen it in Canada. And it allows you to dramatise the pieces that would be difficult to get people to talk about, but it also allows you to interview people, historians or descendants of these wonderful women. And so you get this lovely mix of, and a great way to tell stories. So the reason that I wanted to do it was that I've been back in New Zealand for probably about three or four years. And I was already part of the documentary department uh, in Television New Zealand. And I started to get a bit appalled about the fact that there were two major drama series being made or, or had been screened, which were about New Zealand history, but they were all about chaps. <laughs> and it was like the, the women had completely sort of disappeared as being in the least bit important to New Zealand history. So I got a bit of hot under the collar about that, <laughs> having come from two wonderfully pioneering grandmothers. Yeah. And I started to lobby to see if we could make some drama about the women. Yeah. And uh, fortunately, there had been a woman in New Zealand who'd done quite a lot of research and found letters and um, had also recorded some interviews with descendants of people who knew stories. Uh, because first of all, of course, uh, the uh, the bosses had said, well, we, there's nobody knows anything about the women, so how are you going to make the story? So first of all, I got some scripts together and then just started to lobby and it was quite difficult, and I have to say, you know, we have a we have a fine um, her story in New Zealand of of New Zealand being the uh, the first country in the world where women achieved the vote. However, that obviously didn't ever get as far as, as television, uh, where, where women were. Well, I was the first the first woman producer director that they'd had. In many a long year, they'd had apparently one before me many years before I arrived. But they they said, "Oh, you know, she was. <laughs> we're not have. We don't want any more women because you know, she was so emotional. We couldn't stand it. <laughs> so that was their reason for not hiring women. Women were allowed to be secretaries, and that was pretty much oh, it. God, but anyway, medieval. <laughs> 
Well, really difficult because nobody listens to you or none of the, none of the, the male bosses listen to you in the way you need to be heard. Yeah. You know, you think, I've got this great story and it's about this, about this, and you can see their eyes glaze over and they go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> However, we had a change of head of department, so I started lobbying again. And he had actually come from drama, and he was interested in trying out this d- dramatized documentaries. And so he said, "Yes, let's do it." I'm so wondering. I know it was just—it was so exciting. So the first series were, were half hours, yeah. and there were supposed to be four series. Actually, there were supposed to be great grandmothers and then the next series was going to be our grandmothers and then yeah. the next series was going to be our mothers and then the final series was actually not going to be dramatized it was going to be about our generation yeah and the first series was so well received i mean the women who truly make up the you know the probably the greater viewing audience as long as it's not sport just absolutely adored the series and it won a an award for for interestingly best drama which was lovely yes i know it was great and so then we started on the second series and and because it had been so popular i said all right well then let's do them as one hour programs instead of half hour programs yeah but that was wonderful we made i made three yeah. and then there were still three more to make and we had a change of the big boss at the top yeah. um cancelled the second half of the series saying he was yet to be convinced that women were interesting oh, <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> so, you know, and what do you do? You get you stay in there and you fight and you know, I I got to make um other documentaries about women, um yeah. social documentaries, which is you know my my big love. And so you just go on. You know, there's always that 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 you want you want to throw all your toys out of the cot and resign and walk off but what's the point yeah yeah <laughs> not going to help it's not going to help women so let's yeah. not let's not go there <laughs> yeah yeah oh god oh it must have been frustrating oh, oh, oh. very 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 <laughs> okay so for the ones that you were that you did and the the women you interviewed did mm-hmm. you see any overriding themes that link these women in their attitude or character or the environment around them? Yes, to, to some extent. I mean, it, it, I was never going to be able to do a, a broad cross-section because um, the women at least had to be literate. They had to have, you know, written letters or, or journals or, you know, diaries or something. But, I mean, they were very diverse, and I did manage to actually do a, a couple of them that were well, one was a a what we call Pakiha, a, a European young girl who was taken away by a Maori tribe and raised as Maori and identified as Maori uh, long after she'd been um, found again. Yeah. Um, and I also did <clears throat> another one on Princess Tapuya, who is a very famous Maori uh, kuya and um, and head of her tribe at the time. But what they had in common, I think, was that they a, they knew they had to survive. This was particularly true for the Pakeha women, who often were miles and miles and miles away from any other civilization. If the if the the husband had um, had a farm or was clearing timber or or whatever, yep. and these women, honestly, they. They survived, they bore the children, and they educated the children. And we forget that, that the early education of the children here in the, in the late 1800s was all done by the women. Yes. Because there wasn't anywhere else for them to go. Yeah, I, I mean, one of the, one of the that I did on, on Nellie Hewitt, the, the nearest other family to her was a was a two-day ride away on horseback really and they had these babies and they raised them and they raised healthy children and so I think there was a certain I think 
it's very true there is such a thing as a pioneer spirit. For many of those women, and the men and the women, they had come, even though things were hard, they had come to a better life from the one they left. Okay. It was very interesting. A number of, um, about four years ago, I went up to Scotland to to find the place where my Scottish ancestors came from. Yeah. And it was a very good thing to do. I stood at, at the place where they had, had worked or, you know, barely worked really and barely had survived yeah. and realised that, of course, they had, no, they had no regrets. They had no backward look. They had come to a much better life and their children had come to a much better life. Yes, it makes such a difference when, when you look at it like that. But yes, so with you saying that with this woman, the, the nearest neighbours were two days away. Mm -hmm. so that, in fact, any problem at all, the woman mm -hmm. was not only the educator, but she was the nurse, the doctor, everything. Indeed, the cook. Yeah. <laughs> and often helped with the building of the, the house and the outbuildings and also helped with the farm. Yep, yeah. I mean, they were extraordinary women. Oh, I, I would love to meet them. <laughs> and I would love to live in that time. It sounds fabulous. Very challenging, but fabulous. Such an adventure. Yes. <laughs> and out of um, all of the women you, you spoke about or that you interviewed, you made the documentaries about, were there any major differences? I mean, I've asked you about the links, but were there any major differences as well? Or did it, was it the pioneering spirit that sort of... Was yes, the pioneering spirit. Yes, I mean, I've often asked myself, you know, was there a, a class difference? But in fact, one of the things that you could really see in those stories was that class became less and less relevant. And I suspect that was also, or I'm not sure it was as true in Australia, but it certainly was true in New Zealand because we, you know, we were more settled by the, the New Zealand company, which was a company that supposedly bought land, took it rather, I think, and missionaries. So people just had to get on with it. Yes. And so I think that that would be one of the major things. And probably is still true today okay. yes we're quite we're quite strong about that Anna yes that's good like <laughs> strong. strong is good particularly yes. in women <laughs> yes <laughs> but okay so I know you've already said that the series was really well received by the public mm -hmm. how was it received by the media and the establishment and what do you think we can learn from this? Because I get the impression that it's very different. The, the way the public perceives things and the way the other people perceive things, there can be quite a big difference. Yes, I think that um, it's a difficult one because unlike uh, in Britain where you have the BBC, um, we have the Canadian model here, which is that our public broadcaster is commercial. Yeah. And so still, in fact, probably completely now, what is screened on television or what and what is paid for is pinned absolutely on the advertiser. Oh, really? Yes, the advertising agencies have an enormous say in, in what is screened in New Zealand. Oh. And so, uh, you know, in our, in our cause media women was a, and well, still is, but it was a very big force some years ago. And we used to talk about that and go, well, what we need is we need more women in advertising. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, of course, they run into exactly the same problem in advertising as they do in, in television. So uh, we, but we keep on fighting. And you know what's made the biggest revolution, of course, is that now we can talk to people, you know, via our computers, via, via Facebook, via a whole lot of other ways of communicating that were not available to us earlier on. And that gives us clout, I think. Yeah. But, I mean, I know you, you mentioned BBC, but there was an article 
sometime this week about women in the media in the UK. Um, mm -hmm. And there are really not enough. There are far yes. less. Um, yes. There seems to be quite a lot of women in the media, but when you're talking about presenters or anyone that's really got power and is doing something in your face, it's still yes. predominantly male. Yes, that's absolutely true. It's the same, and it is the, it is the same here. It's, it's about you know those in, in positions to make decisions, um, you know, or to sort of ha have the checkbook. Uh, yeah. There are a few and far between. Oh, so and nice. in fact, there are fewer women now working in film and television than there were after uh, after I had my campaign and employed all sorts of women. And there was a whole lot of women before I left television. Really? Because I was going to ask you next, which is obviously a good time to ask it. How do you think the attitude towards women and the opportunities for them has changed? And what is different today? Right. Because um, it sounds like it's gone backwards. <laughs> well, it, in some ways it has, and in other ways it hasn't. In that public broadcasting is just a, a sort of pale shadow of what it used to be. And it has very, very few production departments now. That means that most of the product is um, developed by independent filmmakers. And there are quite a lot of them. I'd say that we were, there's probably just about as many really good, strong women making programs. The problem with us, really, is that we want to make programs that are important and <laughs> socially responsible. Yeah. And they're not always the ones that get the nod for television. But the head of New Zealand Film Commission for a very long time was a woman, and uh, not, not anymore, but there's strong women in there. Yeah. And the head of New Zealand On Air, which is the government-funded funding body for independent productions, is a woman. And I do think that makes a difference. I mean, I'm well out of the loop now. It, it's, a, it's an industry for young women, and yeah. I had other things that I needed to go off and do. But and it comes and goes. It's really, really interesting, you know. And while we have only commercial television, then film is becoming uh, probably a place where more women's voices are being heard and there are more women producers. Yeah. Um, yes, we've got quite a, it's not huge, but we have quite an interesting film industry here. Yeah. Apart from Lord of the Rings. <laughs> <laughs> I know. Okay, so thinking about what you've just said about it coming and going and the, the differences and the, the changes really in what women can do and where they can do it, mm -hmm. how do you think we can use that knowledge? So the knowledge of the, the sort of, the flow, the, it doesn't seem to be regular. It seems to be different mm. niches coming to the fore and different priorities coming to the fore. How can we use that to help us in our professional life and maybe even our personal life? But I would say it's more adapted to professional life. What do you think? Yes, being aware, I think, Probably I'm going to put on my, um, my career counselling hat now because I think it's about staying up to date, but it's staying up to date with skills that don't necessarily appear to be part of making television you know, programmes or, or films. So I think it's, I mean, I would call myself as, you know, a portfolio woman, which is that uh, there's all sorts of things I do. But yes. if I really look at it, I'm using the same skills. Yes. So I think it's, it's staying adaptable. It's staying, you know, I mean, I think women can dance much more elegantly than men can. So we, yes. we sort of dance with it. Yes. And as long as we are doing something that we enjoy, yeah. or in my case, that we love, then stay with it because your skills and your enthusiasm will get you through to where you want to go. That would be, always be my advice. My other piece of advice would always be, if you're bored, get out. 
Yes. It's the best indicator that things aren't working for you and you're a highly skilled person. You've got all of these other skills. They just need a bit of an assessment to find out where else you could put them where you wouldn't be bored. Yeah, perfect. You are listening to Anna Letitia Cook at Women Up Radio. Okay, so... I know you're also, you're a facilitator for HR and change management, which mm-hmm. links very well to what you've just said, um, yep. and also for staff motivation and development, career and professional, as well as life skills, and mm-hmm. you work both in the private and the public sector. What do you find are the challenges and the issues that women come up against most often? I, um, I think the Partly, Anna, I think it's actually about being heard, which is still a bit of a problem. Yeah. But it's, you see, I think that women are a great deal more adaptable to change mm-hmm. than men are. I yes. just think that's, that's in our genes, really. Yeah. I just think that, you know, we, we have all of those wonderful survival skills that yeah. <laughs> really require us to be very adaptable in any situation. Yeah. And one of the things that I'm really working on is that in the whole area of change management, and I mean, that sort of covers everything. I mean, that covers career management and it covers, you know, all sorts of things, is that there's a lot of talk at the moment. I'm seeing it all the time, this big question about why are people so scared of change? Well, I wouldn't say that why people are so scared of change, but Men in very senior positions, both in in government departments and in the private sector, do seem to be very afraid of change or very worried by it, as as if they haven't sort of got, they don't know how to get their head around it. And one of the things that started me thinking about this was that in the networks that I'm I'm part of, in the, the business networks, is that what seems to happen with these wonderful women who are working in, in change management as, as private consultants, is that the, the, the CEO or the, you know, the, the top person in, in the organisation is actually, well, particularly if it's a government department, they're told, well, you know, this is by the minister, this is, this is the way things are going to be and this is what you have to do, you have to change so that we get this outcome. Yeah. And what happened an awful lot of the time is that the CEO hands off down down to his managers and says, fix it. Yeah. Make it happen. Yeah. But in fact, if the if the top person the top person has to be the driver. And if they're not driving the change in a collaborative way, then it's just hopeless. And you can just see these organisations getting more and more frustrated, more and more upset, and the minister getting crosser and crosser. Yeah. And, I mean, the same in, in, in private, you know, in, in the private enterprise, is that it's the, the big kids that have to take on board and they have to put their hand on the tiller, to use a sailing yeah. analogy, and go with it. And in that way, I think, you know, and, and bring in your women and sa- ask them, you know, yes. how do you think that this would be able to happen? How can we, the big question, I think, is how can we take the organisation with us, yeah. you know, in the change, rather than, you know, just having a terrible mess and people leaving and breaking yeah. things, things yeah. like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so what do you think is the best way to do that because if you don't have well if, if it's not being led from the top if it's being driven as you say rather than being led it's mm. very different difficult to get the openness to get the flexibility to get the yes. motivation from anybody so yes. how can a woman overcome that and how can they find the best way to progress but mm. The thing to me is very important is while still being fulfilled and still maintaining inner energy because if you have to become a male clone and if you have to become aggressive and attack in the same way that men sometimes have to I yes. don't think it gives us peace of mind it doesn't give us the opportunity to show off our 
our real skills, our real strengths. So how, what would you recommend? What, what do you think is the, the best way to progress? Well, I mean, I think you've put your finger on it and uh, about the fact that we don't want women to be acting the same way as men. Right. And unfortunately, Anna, there's still the majority of, no, I wouldn't say the majority, a lot of women, particularly in that first wave that got to very senior positions, yeah. in fact, act very much like their, their male colleagues. Yeah. And that's not surprising, surely. After all, where were their role models? Yes. When they came into the business, the only role models they had was were the, were the men, and they were saying, "This is the way that you do it." And if you want to get to the top, this is you know, yes. this is the way you have to do it. And why I'm starting to look at change in a very different way, and why I'm not sure that it is genderized really, is that I think there's a different conversation to be had where men and women can learn from each other because I think that we have different, I mean, you can get into the nurture nature argument, but I mean, we, we, we have different things that we can contribute because we can do them more easily. Yes. And men have things that they can contribute because they can do them more easily. Yeah. So somebody <laughs> said to me, and this is what started me off on this whole thinking about change management, is that I, I also belong to the, to the order of bards, ovates, and druids. So I'm a druid. Right. And we, we do a lot of talking to trees, if you like. I talk to trees. I have a favorite. <laughs> <laughs> I don't necessarily admit that around the board table, but there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but I started off with the question about why is change so difficult? And then I thought, it's ridiculous that change is so difficult because we live with change every day. Yes. Right? I mean, the, the sun goes round and the moon goes round. And, you know, so we go from dark to light and we go from breakfast to lunch to dinner. Yes. And then we live with the change of the seasons yes. all the time. And if, you start doing a bit of a, a bit of reading about the way about our physiology in different seasons. Our bodies react to the changing of the seasons in quite amazing and radical ways. Yeah. So, okay, so then that's what the trees do. The trees don't worry about change. The trees just go, okay, here it is. You know, now it's winter and we put, you know, we put the roots down and all of the energy goes down into the roots. Lovely, yeah. lovely. And we sop up all of the sugar and everything to make us strong. And then spring comes and we sort of emerge. And, you know, and then summer comes and we're sort of getting ready for whatever it is we're going to produce, whether that's fruit or, you know, whether it's other trees or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And eventually we come to autumn, we come to harvest. And I thought, that's change. Yeah. And could we look at that in, in the way that we do it as humans? And then, funnily enough, and you see, I think it's time has come, is that all of a sudden, there are a whole lot of books and conversations and documentaries about trees and what we can learn from trees and how they actually talk to one another, how they communicate, how they protect each other, how they, you know, through the, through the seasons. Yeah. And I thought, Aha. <laughs> so I have taken those four key seasonal words, which is, you know, initiation or beginnings, when the seed is in the soil and, and then emergence and then maturation, maturing and then manifestation and harvest, is could we actually have really deep understanding of change in a natural way so that we could actually see it as a process? Because what I've said to a number of my colleagues is you have the most amazing tools for change management. Yeah. What we need is an understanding of the process so that we can work out when to use which tool. Oh, yes, yes. Because, you know, sometimes we go into, you know, where a change is required in an organisation, we come in and you know, they go, I want this outcome and this is what's got to happen. And what do we do? We go straight to maturation 
when we know we're ready for it or the organizations know when they're ready for it. So all of a sudden we're doing spreadsheets and we're doing business plans and we're doing, it's far too early. Yes. We've got two, two seasons to go through before you yeah. get there. Yeah. Okay, so that what's brought you to develop your tool, Natural yes. Change. Ah, because I know you were telling me about that and how it can really facilitate our work life and projects and career development and everything and for resourcing in a strength and energy. Okay, so tell us more. How can you apply it in the business world? It sounds such a good idea. The idea of the seasons and that everything has to have the right stage. Mm -hmm. I know from the businesses I work with, you're exactly right when you say that they go straight to the end. Oh, well. They don't start with the, the sort of the growth, the, the birth, the growth and all of that. So That's you, right. Tell us more. Sorry, tell us more. Oh, well, <laughs> right. So <laughs> if, you, if you think about the sea, well, let's, let's, be, um, let's be a grapevine, right? <laughs> so you're very fond of the harvest of the grape. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> so the sprouts, sprouts and wine, yes, very apt. <laughs> indeed, indeed. <laughs> so, if you think about it, in the winter, then the the seed, the the grapes that haven't been harvested, they they drop the seeds into the soil, right? So, in the time of of winter, they're sitting. The seeds are sitting beneath the beneath the soil, and they're warm and cozy there. And um, it is a time of transition to endings and beginnings and so are they just lying there under the under the earth well no they're not because something very interesting is happening there's a little spark of life there's you know who knows what that is i mean that's the mystery really yeah. um and so the the step from getting the spark you know which is what it is that you want to start happening yeah. is that the the sea doesn't immediately leap up above the earth and start doing what it you know because it doesn't actually know that yet. Yeah. All it knows is it's, is that in the winter I call that potential and possibility. Yeah. What is its potential? Right, yeah. and the way that we we get to to make the best of potential and possibility is to be open to it. So what I say in business is. Don't make the decision too quickly. Don't say, okay, this is what we're going to do and that's it. You know, everybody line up. But be open to all of the potential and possibility that that change might, might bring and what it might need. Yes. And, then, and then the last little part of that initiation is also be aware that there are others like you. I mean, the, you know, the grape seeds there. And it goes, oh, look, there's a whole lot of other little grape seeds all with this, this whole spark. So yeah. let's communicate. And it's the really interesting thing because there's lots of uh, things being written now about how seeds under the soil and, and roots under the soil actually communicate yes. and talk to one another in, yeah. you know, important ways. Yes. So that's the, that, so those are the three, the three steps of, of initiation. This is yeah. before you even poke your head up above the soil. So the more that you actually share what it is that you're wanting to happen with people who are like you, not people who want to cut your head off or put you down or, yeah. you know, but people like you. What I found is that you, you gain greater and greater clarity yes. on what it is that would that has your heart, if you like, you know, what, what it is that is the way forward, that is exciting, okay? And then you have to take a risk. So, you know, or plant, so here's our little grape, and it goes, okay, I'm going to poke my head up above the soil because I'm passionate about growing. Yeah. <laughs> becoming, and becoming a grape. So <laughs> up it goes, and, of course, it's springtime. So... It's all about growth, but it's also about nurture. And that's the thing that I think in business, that's the biggest, biggest thing that we forget completely, yeah. right. is that an idea, a good idea, has to be nurtured. 
Yes. First of all, we have to be passionate about it. So that's kind of the first, you know, when it, woo, here it goes, and there's the nice warm spring rain, and down it comes. But if you've ever noticed a grape or a tomato or whatever, that there's the growth can be just go wild, you yeah. know. It, um, and there's some point, I think, in there, in that segment of emergence, which is about commitment. Somewhere in there, you make or an organization does, makes a commitment, and it's not a commitment of the checkbook. It's a commitment of the heart. Yeah. You know, so to move it forward. And when that happens, then there's a, the, as this, the, the grapevine is growing and growing and growing, then there is a, a point, that final point in springtime, which is what I call alignment, which is about aligning our idea or in an organization with the true purpose of what we were there to do. Yeah. You know, can get very enthusiastic about something. It all seems to be coming together all awfully well and people are all talking about it. Blah, blah. And you need to actually take a moment to say, is this where we intended to be heading? Yes. Yeah. Are, are we still keen about becoming a grape? Or <laughs> have we actually sort of gone off course a bit? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so then I think there's, there's always a risk in some of these things. So then you're moving into, into maturation. And so the vine is maturing. And it's, this is the time when now you're ready for the business plans and the audit and the whatever. If you've got real clarity yeah. on its identity, right, or your own identity if we're doing yeah. personal growth, but the identity of the change and how the organisation is going to uh, look and what its identity is, then you can go, all right, now the, now the structure, now the discipline. You know, if it's the grape, then we put up, we put up the, the trellis, you know, and we yeah. pinch out some of the laterals because the most important thing that we want in the organisation or with the grape, is we want the best possible harvest. Yes. All right? So that's when the discipline needs to, to come in. That we need Now we're ready because we've, we've had the nurture. And so we can still keep that excitement. And now we're a lot more open to saying, okay, right, well, then the budget does have to come down a bit and, you know, we do, and, and these are the plans because people are ready for it. Yeah, yeah. Because they can see the end, you know, the end of what it is they're wanting to achieve and they can see that it's possible. Yes. And so then it moves, it moves through into, there's another segment in there that, that I call ripening, which is also you know, just move it, moving more and more towards the, the final harvest. Yeah. And then moving into the, the, the final segment, the segment of, of manifestation, is there's one more little step which I always say is you just need to take a look and see if there is any final tweak that needs to be done before the, the whole thing is manifest. I actually call it healing, but it's not a big, it's not a big healing. It's, you know, it's those, just those last little bits so that you have it perfect. And then of course this, the, that quadrant is harvest, is, is manifestation. And the last little piece of that is what I call reflection, which is when you've achieved something, then you must, must, first of all, take time to celebrate, yeah. which is good when it's the grape, and secondly, time to reflect before, before round you go again. So that's my, that's my wheel of natural change. I think it's fabulous. That is fascinating because it really portrays exactly what you should do in uh -huh. and nobody does. <laughs> And nobody does because maybe we've looked in the wrong place. You see, yeah. I say to people, go and watch your tomato grow yeah. <laughs> or your broad bean or something and just see what the process is because once we've got it, we understand it as a natural process and it's up to us to become part of the natural process. I mean, I think for all sorts of reasons, including the survival of the planet, if you don't mind my saying so. I think it's amazing. That is such a good 
way of doing something and it's so strong for a company if mm -hmm. they do it like that they build really strong foundations but also yeah. from each stage there are so many other things that they can use the knowledge for as well indeed okay and so there could be smaller smaller you know, process cycles yeah. within this the uh, the quadrants if yeah. you like within, yeah. exactly. you know and because it's such a simple thing and because we only have to look out of the window to see what it is or look at the pot plant yeah. on the desk is that you don't have to go to huge manuals or you know great seminars or yeah. you know that go on for weeks and weeks or whatever yeah. or get your degree Yes. All you have to do is to think about the process of natural change yeah. 